Good evening. This is Perspectives, a new weekly program from The Voice of America that brings you in-depth, one-on-one conversations with policymakers and leaders who shape the world through international relations, business, and culture. I'm Setare Derakshish. My guest tonight is Walter Isaacson. As the former chairman and CEO of CNN and managing editor of Time magazine, Mr. Isaacson has been at the forefront of the changes in the news media and communications technology. He has advised U.S. presidents and has been actively engaged in world events throughout his career. Currently, he is president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Walter Isaacson is also an acclaimed author, and his biographies of American leaders and innovators have been bestsellers around the world. We begin our conversation tonight with his hugely successful recent biography of Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computer. Steve Jobs was an American icon with a genius sense of technology. With all of these new features, a dramatically improved product. His death at age 56 saddened the tech world that had revered him for decades. Although fired from the company he co-founded in his early years, Jobs was rehired to make Apple an international success. The company excelled at creating computers and software needed for video and audio editing. Next, it moved to shake up the smartphone industry with the iPhone. Apple's iTunes completely changed the way people listen to music, selling more than one million songs in its first week. And its iPad dominates the tablet computer industry. 2010 turned out to be the year of the iPad. 15 million iPads. That's more than every tablet PC ever sold. Steve Jobs chose Isaacson to write his authorized biography. The book has topped bestsellers list in the United States, Asia, and across Europe. Isaacson told me what he learned from Jobs was not just about the life of one man, but how one man can influence the future of the world. I think that the key to innovation in the 21st century will be what Steve Jobs did which is to connect creativity on the one side, you know, sort of imagination and the arts and design to really strong technology and engineering. He said he always wanted to stand at that intersection of what he called the humanities and the sciences. As Steve Jobs would say was, think different. If you look at Einstein, he wasn't the greatest physicist in 1905, but he was able to think differently, to think, okay, if the speed of light is constant, Maybe that means that time is relative, depending on your state of motion. Complicated thing, but it came from thinking different. We well, you know Steve Jobs was a very petulant, demanding, harsh boss. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes say to me, well, you wrote this, is that the way you're supposed to be as a boss? And I say, no, no, no. This is a biography of a particular person. This is not a how-to manual on how to build a company. So learn from all sorts of people. Benjamin Franklin was really nice. He brought people together. He was always kind. Steve was a bit petulant, but he had an artistic sensibility. So you try to take the good from every person you met. We asked our audience, our viewers, and our users to see whether they had any questions for the biographer of Steve Jobs. And people were wondering, in the context of if Steve Jobs were to be born outside of the United States, would he have been or could he have been as successful? And if he was raised in a family, first generation immigrants, would he still be successful? Oh, I think absolutely, because we have examples. I mean, you take Sergey Brin, Larry Page, so many people who are immigrants to the United States or people who were born elsewhere and come to the United States or who were first generation. If you look at the, I think one third of the successful companies started in the past 20 years have been started by people from immigrant families or who are immigrants themselves. That was a statistic I just read. And if you look at Silicon Valley, uh, everything from Yahoo to Google to, you know, uh, eBay, Pierre Almadiar, these are all people. And sometimes I worry in the United States because we have to keep being open in the United States to immigrants, to make people feel they can come here, to make they, sure they can succeed here to allow them to stay here if they want or be educated here and go back and then come back. I think creativity comes when you have sort of a mix of different influences. And so that's why this global age 
where uh, you know people from all over the world are communicating with each other, you get more creativity. So I think you know you just have to learn wherever you live is be open to ideas from all over the place. This is why the internet. This is why digital communications are so great because people can compare ideas from around the world, and to me that helps uh, spur creativity. Isaacson has written about innovators from Benjamin Franklin to Albert Einstein, as well as leadership figures from Thomas Jefferson to Henry Kissinger. He's a scholar of American history, delving into the lives of the country's founding fathers and their struggle for freedom and democracy. In 2009, he reviewed a book by historian Richard Beeman called Plain Honest Men, The Making of the American Constitution. In his review, Isaacson noted that the author captures the nuances and complexities of the compromises that the framers made, knowing when to stand firm on principle or when to find common ground with our fellow citizens is the most important and the most difficult activity in a democracy. Well, there's great interest also for our audiences about American history, and you are a historian. Uh, you have written about the origins of the American Constitution, its strengths, and its frailties also. Now, as we look in the Middle East today, there are new governments emerging as a result of citizen protest. Uh, what, is, what do you see as prospect for these countries? I think it's important to get a good constitutional. Democracy is not just rushing out and having an election. And that's what they did in 1787 in the United States. They got it wrong at first with what were called the Articles of Confederation, so they had to go back and write a constitution. That constitution creates, you know, a democracy, but also checks and balances. And the way it worked out, and Benjamin Franklin was the key here, mm -hmm. was we have to compromise a lot. What he used to say was, compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. And that was a lesson uh, from the American founding. Sometimes they compromised and made a mistake. We all make mistakes. They compromised on slavery. Should not have done that should have stood true to the principle of abolishing slavery outright, right away. That was a compromise they made. We paid for that as a nation. We're not a perfect nation. It took many years, you know, it took 70 years for us to fix that big flaw in our Constitution. But usually, by making compromises, but also standing true to principles, they got it mainly right. <laughs> The Arab Spring ousted dictators in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. Meanwhile, protesters in Syria still face a brutal crackdown as they call for President Bashar Assad to step down. Today in the Middle East, there are new governments emerging as a result of citizen protests in 2011. I asked Isaacson what will be the most important issue for the new leaders who are asked to frame a constitution for their countries. There was a historian once who criticized Benjamin Franklin and said all he really brought to the Constitutional Convention was this feeling of a good-natured religious tolerance. I said to myself, wait a minute, that is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. It was a huge thing in 1790 when people were fleeing Europe because of religious wars and intolerance. It is a huge thing today where religious intolerance is one of, and tribalism is one of the big problems we face. So as you're framing a Constitution, it seems to me one of the important things is not only to say that the majority rules, but to say we're going to respect the rights of each individual and each group and have a good-natured religious tolerance, ethnic tolerance for people who come from different backgrounds, even if they're not in the majority. I would like to um, read a little bit what you wrote also from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you said that religion, what you were quoting him, religion is a subject on which I have ever been most scrupulously reserved. I have considered it as a matter between every man and his maker in which no other and far less the public had a right to intermeddle. New governments right now are struggling with this issue, as you also mentioned, of secular uh, or religious-based states. Where do you think this is going? You know, I think that's why every new government and every group that's trying to create a democracy should say, how can we do it and make our society feel welcoming to people of different religious beliefs? Now, that may not seem so hard, but it's been hard for the past thousand years. I mean, history is filled with examples of religious conflict. And I think 
and this is Benjamin Franklin as well as Thomas Jefferson and others, they believe that at the core of religion is loving thy neighbor as thyself. It's in every religious text you can find. So you see similarities between uh, Thomas Jefferson of the late 18th century and what's happening with the new framers of these countries right now, let's say in the Middle East. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the framing of the American Constitution came at a time when people had fled England and Holland and other places in Europe in order to seek religious freedom. But when they got here, a lot of them had different religions. And for a while, the state of Rhode Island had to be formed because it was formed by a group of people who got kicked out of the, the state of Massachusetts. But when they finally get around to writing the Constitution, they say, no matter what your religious beliefs are, you have a right to be in this country, and you have a right to your voice, and you have a right to have a protection so that the majority can't just uh, you know, vote that you're not allowed to practice your religion. Through the Aspen Institute, an international organization where Isaacson is president and CEO, critical issues are discussed through open-minded dialogue. You know, what we do is a few things. We bring people from around the world to discuss uh, subjects of mutual interest, whether it's how to invest better in the West Bank and help Palestinian small businesses, or how to do health care or environment. We also do leadership training. We have leadership groups all over the world, six or seven in Africa, Latin America, India, uh, you know, United States, where 20 or 30 people get together for, and uh, sort of do projects mm -hmm. together, try to figure out what common values they share. So I think it's an institute that's based on common values and, you know, how can you take those common values and become a leader? In an essay, you called for a reset of the United States policy um, towards the Middle East in 2009, December of 2009. Some might say that uh, the U.S. position has not moved the Israelis and the Palestinians any closer together since you wrote that essay. Uh, what is needed to make progress? Well, clearly more than just my essay, since people aren't reading them, <laughs> except for you. I appreciate it. I'd forgotten about that essay. And sure, to make progress, we all know what the basic solution is to the Israeli-Palestinian situation. We know within a few hundred yards where the border probably should be. It's where Bill Clinton got to the Taba parameters. It's, you know, it's been negotiated. I think what we need is not understanding what the solution is, but how do we get people to that solution? More importantly, how do we get our leaders to that solution? What about uh, people? I mean, the antagonism that exists yeah. among people. Right. What would you do with that? You know, I've been involved with the U.S.-Palestinian partnership. It's something that's been now through two administrations. And we help give loans to small businesses in the West Bank. We help with housing projects. We help with uh, venture capital for IT, electronics, and telecommunications industry. So I think what some of us can do is help build a better middle-class economy throughout the region. We're doing that with the Partners for a New Beginning, something that Secretary Hillary Clinton asked us to set up. And that, too, is mainly business-oriented, where American businesses and European businesses and Asian businesses and uh, businesses from the Muslim and Middle East, um, m Muslim world in the Middle East, are working together to try to create uh, new opportunities and new jobs. Conflicts can break out anywhere around the world. Um, on the campaign trail, we have seen that U.S. candidates for presidency, uh, they sometimes talk loosely and with a lot of passion about uh, military action against sovereignties that they fear might threaten the United States. And you wrote in the New York Times book review in 2010 about the United States declaring war, whether it's the president or Congress that has the power. In the New York Times, I was writing about a constitutional debate we still have in this country which is what is the role of Congress in deciding whether we're going to have military action, and what is the role of the president. This goes back to George Washington when he was sending in troops without Congress's permission, and it of course goes to every war since World War II where Congress has been involved in the war-making decision but hasn't formally declared war. A in the future, I think that America has to work with allies and not try to unilaterally uh, dictate what goes on around the world. In the months before the last presidential election in July 2007, you urged the candidates uh, for the President of the United States to
to articulate as part of their campaign imaginative ideas and vision, similar that was seen six decades earlier, such as the Marshall Plan and NATO and Radio Free Europe. What would you urge the candidates to articulate in this upcoming presidential election? If you look at what they created 60 years ago, and with a friend I wrote a book called The Wise Men, which is about these very creative people in the late 1940s who saw a whole new global uh, struggle emerging, uh, both against communism and against the East-West struggles, and they invented things like the World Bank and NATO and the International Monetary Fund and, you know, these type of institutions. NATO was probably not well designed to figure out what to do in Afghanistan or Iraq. Likewise, we're seeing the problems of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank dealing with the crisis in the Eurozone, or for that matter, the global financial crisis. New formations, you mean? These yeah. are not what we already have. Right. In other words, new ways to make sure that all countries can succeed in keeping their currencies and having their autonomy, and yet we can still have a stable global financial system. Mm -hmm. Likewise, there's a struggle against types of terrorism. Uh, we are trying to use NATO and all sorts of other uh, institutions to do things it wasn't exactly built for, whether it's in the Middle East or anywhere in the world. There are a lot of countries and a lot of people who stand firm against a terrorist threat. We should have an organization of defense against global terrorism, global cyber terrorism, you know, internet terrorism, uh, all these types of new threats that we face, uh, biological and chemical warfare type things, and the countries that want to try to resist either the terrorists or the problems you can have with cyber warfare and hackers and things like that, they can come up with a common set of rules and act in unison the way they did 60 years ago when various alliances were formed uh, right after World War II. You mentioned, sir, the global economic crisis. I want to ask you to help me understand what's going on with capitalism and how does it measure with alternatives? Because the world is looking at the economic condition of the United States, of uh, the European Union, and it is comparing it to also to Brazil and, uh, let's say, China. I think that open markets, uh, fair markets, really do help make creative products. They can be abused, but you take Steve Jobs. What did he do? He, he was a capitalist. He was about the purest capitalist you could imagine. When Steve Wozniak, his friend, invents a circuit board, Steve Jobs says, hey, let's package it and sell it and mark it up by 50% and we can make a profit. And thus, you have Apple Computer. How do they succeed? They succeed by making good products. The iPhone, the iPad, the iPod. These are things that people say, okay, in a free market, I'm going to want to spend my money to buy that as a gift, to buy it for myself. Sometimes in capitalism, though, instead of creating great products, you create ridiculous financial instruments and you secretly put bad mortgages into some, you know, uh, debt obligation that you then collateralize and you sell it. Those people aren't making good products. And those people sometimes get rewarded for it. Sometimes they make large amounts of money for doing all sorts of complex financial instruments that, in my opinion, don't add anything of value to the economy. And that's when you have a financial system collapse. I don't think we've had a problem with capitalism. We've had a problem with our financial systems in the West, our banking and finance system. Companies that make good products do well. Companies that make bad products don't do well. That's what good capitalism, bad capitalism is all about. Our problem is I think we have unregulated, unfettered, around the world uh, financial system in which people have done things that they knew we're not really adding value to this world, and they get paid a lot of money to do it. In April 2011, Isaacson sat down with three former secretaries of state, Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, and James Baker, and asked them this question. How do you think we should, the role of values, democracy, and freedom should play in our foreign policy? I put that same question to him. I think America has always has to stand true to its values. Its values are simple. We respect freedom, democracy, democratic institutions around the world. Every now and then you can say, well, for our short-term benefit, we should be supporting 
this regime, even if it's very repressive? You've got to be careful on that. I think America should always be willing to support the long-term aspirations of any people, not to impose our system on them, mm -hmm. but for them to be able to create the systems of governance that they think best for themselves, and they have the freedom to be involved in making that decision. Now, you have called uh, trustworthy news and information objective, accurate uh, media, the oxygen of democracy. Is this something that you're referring to also when you talk about that? I think that if you look at the arc of history, it's bent towards democracy and freedom whenever there is a free or flow of information. Because what does information do? It empowers the individual, makes the individual smarter, makes the individual better able to make the decisions. And so if you stop repressive regimes that are trying to control information, whether they be in North Korea or in Iran these days, where they're trying to control information, eventually people will have more freedom because they will have more control and more understanding of what's going on. The mission of the Voice of America is to provide accurate and objective news and information to areas like Iran, North Korea, and other parts of the world that lack freedom of information. Until recently, Mr. Isaacson headed the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which oversees U.S. government broadcasting, including the Voice of America. He has seen firsthand the challenges that Iran poses. The Iranian government continues to jam international broadcasting satellites including the Voice of America's. There is a growing list of imprisoned journalists in Iran. The government continues to place bans on several newspapers. And recently, Iran's government blocked a virtual U.S. Embassy website set up to provide Iranian citizens information about traveling and studying in America. How do you deal with these challenges? Well, you know, we fight every month to try to make sure people are blocking satellites, you know, let them in. We're trying to do more satellite TV into China. We're trying to keep ahead of things. If you were to say, what could we invent that would make the free flow of information better, you'd say, how about the internet? That would really work. That allows information to flow freely. So we're breaking down the firewalls. We're setting up proxy servers so that people in various parts of the world, including Iran, including in China, can get access to information on the internet. Just as they did when they created Voice of America, just as they did when they created Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, we are now entering into an age where we have to stop people who want to block the flow of information into their countries through the internet. The good thing is the internet seems to be able to work around people who want to block it, and we have to encourage people to have the power to work around those who would restrict the internet. In the early days of internet journalism, Isaacson was the top new media editor at Time magazine before becoming chief editor in 1996. As new media editor, he pioneered using online tools to shape the news. How do you assess and how do you evaluate the uh, progress or the direction that new media has taken? Uh, and where is it going? Where do you see it's going? I think the World Wide Web was, has become a great publishing platform, but what we're moving to is more of a social media platform where there's interaction, whether it be Facebook or Twitter, where it's not companies like Time Magazine creating a website and handing down information, but people sharing information. So we're moving from sort of what I would call a publishing internet, meaning websites, to a social internet, which is where people share information. This is very good, but I do think it's very important, even in the age of the social internet, to say we need people, whether it's Voice of America, Time Magazine, whoever it may be, who are actually reporting news, have an objective, and are going to distribute it electronically, because not everything can be done through reading your friend's tweets and looking at their Facebook pages. The cover of Time Magazine, the person of the year, was the protester. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on that. I do think it's been a year, as Kurt Anderson wrote in that piece, that's like 1968, maybe even 1848, where people going into the streets have changed the way the world works. And there's no one person who would symbolize that. 
you can have the Tunisian, you know, vendor who burned himself. You can have the guy in Egypt who had the Facebook page. But really, it was much broader than that. I do think that the interesting thing is that the protests are connected to the free flow of information, that they spread because of things like Facebook and Twitter. They spread because we can share ideas on the internet. Whether it's Occupy Wall Street or the people in Tahir Square, new communications has led to an ability to empower yourself to be out on the streets. Now, will the evolution of media, of new media, do you think it will remain a stimulus to change? Yes. I think sometimes the Internet can be problematic. That sometimes people can use it to repress people. Sometimes it can be dangerous. People get caught out, you know, doing things and by repressive regimes. But in the end, the more there's a free flow of information and an exchange of ideas, the more individual empowerment occurs. And there's not much of a difference between individual empowerment and freedom and democracy. Those two go together. Now, we started this conversation, this discussion, with the biography of Steve Jobs. I'd like to end this uh, in interview also with two very brief questions. Uh, whose biographies would you like to write most, or you're thinking about writing? I'm thinking I want to go back to do somebody historical. You get kind of exhausted when you do somebody who's been alive, because you're dealing with them and it's very emotional. I was thinking of doing uh, Ada Lovelace, Ada Byron Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, who in the 1840s uh, was a great mathematician. Her father was a poet, so she decides, and her mother decides she should be a mathematician. And it connects, as I said earlier, imagination to technology. And she creates the notion that you can write an algorithm, or what we would call a computer program, to take a calculating machine and make it do amazing things. So to me, that creativity then she might be the subject of my next book. I asked Walter Isaacson what he would like to see in a biography about himself. He said, I hope nobody writes about me. My life is not as interesting as the people I write about. Well, I think that book will be written, and I look forward to reading it. For Perspectives, I'm Setare Derakshesh. Thank you for being with us. Good night.